Hey everyone, uh, I've been wanting to do something like this for quite some time and uh, now I figured I'd start doing a series on uh, the interior of a Type 7C, uh, all of the various components within each of the individual compartments and for that I figured a good vehicle to use uh, because it is detailed to a, to a great extent is the relatively new interior that uh, Usipator Games has uh, introduced in their along in conjunction with Subsim, of course, of Uncle Neil, uh, who's helping the developers create the game, uh, the interior that they've made in the game Wolfpack. Uh, it has uh, some functionality associated with it. They've redone the control room. Most of the functionality is still resides in the control room for your basic functions, uh, as well as the tower and the bridge. Uh, but they are starting to implement some functionalities elsewhere in the boat. For instance, they've moved the compressor, uh, the, the Junkers compressor back to uh, where it belongs in the e-motor room and the after e-motor room slash after computer room. Uh, so you walk back there now to start the compressor, etc. So there are sort of moving in a direction of not complete functionality of the boat. Uh, I would like to hope that that would be the case eventually, but hopefully with this series of videos, uh, it A, can teach my subscribers a little bit about the different functionalities within the boat itself, components and, and functionalities of the, those components within the boat itself, and then also maybe uh, to give uh, the Wolfpack developers a little bit of an idea and plant the seed maybe for some additional functionalities if they do want to go the route of making more things in the boat functional. Uh, so it's just a function of identifying what those things are. Um, and so hopefully that can achieve both of those ends. So what I would like to do then is I'll start in the bow room and just work from 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 uh, bow to stern essentially. Uh, each compartment will have its own video. It's just, there's just too much even in each individual compartment uh, to do more than one compartment. So, uh, so that being said let's kind of get started here. So if you were to walk all the way up now some things in the boat that they've modeled, they've copied 995, which is fine. It's the only Type 7C that we thankfully have left, Type 7C slash 41 at, at any rate. Some of the things in here are going to be uh, not necessarily representative of a standard Type 7C that you would see from the, for the large portion of, uh, percentage of the war. Uh, an example of that is, is the, the loot computer up here, so the loot device. Uh, you can barely see it up there. Uh, and I would say to those watching, pay attention to the little white dot in the middle of my screen because I'm going to use that as my pointer to, to, to point the different uh, areas out that I'm speaking about at the moment. Okay, so you can see hiding just behind uh, the shaft here for opening the, the bow caps. It, peeking out there is the loot device. So this would be, um, so loot standing for lagen, lagen unabhängige torpedo. That would be a torpedo that's uh, that can be fired here irrespective of your position relative to the target. This was implemented very late in the war. Uh, the loot technology did not arrive on scene until very late in the war. U995 was installed with such a device, therefore it's still viewable in the in the game or in in the boat itself and it has that device has made it into the game. The game only goes to 1941. You wouldn't see this type of thing in a boat at that particular period in time. However, what you would see possibly in a boat in 1941 and almost certainly in a boat maybe in 1939 or 1940 is you would actually see the KDB hydrophone array unit up here uh, that is not well known the KDB is your little rotating uh, t-shaped hydrophone device that you see in for instance you can see it in turning in dust boat uh, dust boat is not correct that that device turning up there was not operated from the sound room. It was actually operated from up here between the tubes with a, the shaft of it went directly up into the top deck. Uh, and then there at the bottom of the shaft, the base of the shaft essentially was the, the, the hand wheel to turn it with an indicator, an arrow indicating the direction that it's pointing. Okay. Um, so you would actually have one of your sound men or your radio men slash sound men up here at battle stations uh, servicing the, or manning rather the um, KDB device. Now, because it was so unreliable, because it was so subject to damage from depth charges, it was very very sensitive. Uh, it well, and it actually didn't didn't withstand deep deep diving depths either very well. That uh, whether that was from from the um, 
from the uh, the docs themselves doing it by higher order or if the commanders just decided that they didn't want it on their boat anymore. They started disappearing as the war went on. More and more pictures you see of 1940, 1941, etc. You don't see the KDB device anymore. Commanders or higher ups essentially said, get rid of it. It's just not worth the effort. The range is poor. It's very accurate down to a degree, but the range is poor and the GHG uh, which is the your standard hydrophone array that was outside on the bow planes or above the bow planes rather was had a greater range at the sacrifice of, of accuracy but greater range was felt to be a better asset than the KDB but anyway you'd have your KDB way up there at the front okay so that would be the very very front of the boat the first thing you would see uh, the next obvious thing here are the torpedo tubes of which there are four obviously in the in the bow of the, of the U-boat uh, lots of functionality going on here in real life. Um, I am going to touch on the basics of how these things operated and, and, and we'll leave it at that. Okay. So each torpedo tube has a capacity of about, a, of about 1.6 tons. Okay. So that's, that's about, 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 I, I want to say 1,620 liters, uh, or, or cubic meters is the measurement given in the German documentation. That, that corresponds to about 1.6 tons. Okay. A torpedo weighed about 1.5 tons, your standard German torpedo. The obvious, the excess capacity is, of course, the flood, the water weight that would that would come into the tube upon flooding in preparation for firing. Um, so the way these worked is you've got <clears throat> uh, you've got assume you've got a torpedo loaded in this t in one of these particular tubes here. You have got you'd have your door open here. You'd load your torpedo in. You would um, shut your door. And then you would admit uh, you you have torpedo compensating tanks that are that are right around here under the floor. There's actually two of them, torpedo compensating tanks two and three. You would use these levers over here, and you can see each tube has a set of these levers. One of these levers allowed you to allowed you to dictate what direction you wanted the low pressure air, because low pressure service air was used to move water around in the boat. Um, for, for, for tasks like this, you'd say, okay, you'd flip one switch and say, okay, I want, I want my low pressure air to go to push water out of the torpedo compensating tank, which already had some water in it into the, this torpedo tube. All right. So that's directional. And then the other one is for, um, venting air to, to say, okay, there's two, actually two tubes, one vents air from the, um, front of the torpedo tube and one vents air from the from the um, back of the torpedo tube, toward, more toward the front of the boat, I guess. And that's the other one, right? And so you'd have those dictated, or switched to where you wanted them, and then you would admit your low pressure air into the torpedo compensating tank, which would push the water up into whatever torpedo tube you're intending to flood, okay? And then you'd have the air escaping out of the other, um, out of the other vent, uh, vent pipes, okay? And so you'd have your torpedo tube flooded, right? You once you had your pressure equalized then in the tube, which was another switch, you would have your your bow caps open, your your muzzle door open. And to do that, you would you attach a handle to the shaft right here, and you'd crank it open. Okay, you crank it open, and then you and then you're basically your torpedo is then swimming in water, and it's the pressure is in the tube is equalized with the external water pressure. All right. You would also then behind here, you can see a tank, uh, this container right here. That is the temporary um, tank for to fill with high pressure air to pressurize up to about 30 atmospheres in that in that small tank here to pressurize for launching the torpedo itself. Right. So you would have you would then fill this with with high pressure air. Um, there are high pressure air flasks in in this compartment here. There's a, there's a, there are two groups of high pressure air flasks: one on starboard, one on port side. You actually pressurize this tank here, and then the tank the the pressure air pressure in this these tanks here, one for each tube, would be used to actually push the torpedo out. Now, how does that work? You'd have you could do two th ways of launching. You could either launch with piston or without piston. Launching on the surface was without piston. Launching underwater was with piston. Now, what does that mean? 
a p the piston and you can actually see it once in the video where we do the aft torpedo room I want to say they've modeled the piston that's in 995 that's sitting next to the tube you can actually see it in pictures on the boat that's existing now in Germany uh, but basically what, what a what piston is it's a large disc looking thing that sits just inside the um, the torpedo the the um, door here uh, and you basically what what it does what the way you dictate which way you want to launch is this up here is a um, like a selector switch and it basically directs the air either the high pressure air that launches the torpedo either behind the piston you can see this here behind the piston or there's another tube that should be I'm not sure if it's modeled in here but anyway it should be and here you can see right here this would be the air would be going through this pipe and behind the piston same thing here you'd be going through this pipe and behind the piston to push the piston forward the other alternative is when you're firing on the surface you would switch it to the other way and then it would direct the air down a pipe or like this and push the torpedo out and leave the piston where it sits okay now why would you care about the piston well the reason the piston is there is to prevent the compressed air from leaving the end of the torpedo tube in order to prevent a large bubble on the surface and reveal the U-boat's position. Okay, so um, the Germans would call this a Schwalloser Torpedo Abschuss, which basically means a surgeless torpedo fire, tor torpedo launch. Schwallos, which basically you have no surge of air going out of the tube because the piston stops about a meter before the end of the uh, the end of the tube um, and prevents that air from then leaving from escaping. Where does it go? At that point, what happens is there's a there's a vent valve that's down. Uh, this actually might be them modeling the vent valve. I believe this is it right here. That could be it right there. But at any rate, what happens is <clears throat> once that piston moves forward, there the pressure drops on one side of this vent valve, and then it actually releases the vent valve releases the valve the, a piston in there uh, within that device. There's a small little piston in there. It releases that, and then lets the high pressure air actually vent into the pressure hull and so you'll hear veterans if you hear a veteran being interviewed about a torpedo launch your ears pop when you fire because there's a there's a pressure change um, because the high pressure air that was being in the that was in the tube used, being used to push the torpedo or the piston out uh, is now being vented into the into the pressure hull what does that mean then the piston that is now way up here the external water pressure now pushes the piston back to where it was before. The tube is now filled with water again, and all is right with the world. However, when you shoot the torpedo itself, there is a time interval between the time the torpedo the, the piston launches and the the, the time the the uh, and the moment that the um, the tube fills back up with the water again. That time is enough time to make the chief engineer worried about keeping the bow down. So yes, the tube does fill back up with an equivalent weight in water to replace the torpedo. However, that it doesn't. That's not enough, you know, to prevent the maybe the bow from popping up because you've got a, a period of time there between the launch itself and the pushing the piston back, where you've got you don't have that weight anymore, and that's enough time to make the bow potentially raise up. It's particularly pronounced when you have a when you're firing a fan or four, right? And so, so the the chief engineer would would actually have to take the necessary measures in order to compensate for that. And that's actually why, when you, if you were to have, if you were to put yourself back in, you know, in a boat in, in 1941 or whatever, and you were witnessing a, a launch, you know, the commander would would put about it, would insert about an eight second pause between when he says fascia, like for example, fascia, you know. Dot, pop, 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 dot, 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 los. That pause is so that you is, is allowing the chief engineer to take those measures in preparation for flooding forward a little bit to, to offset that momentary loss of weight. Now they're going to get the weight back, obviously, because the piston is going to come back in, and he's going to have to take the necessary countermeasure to get that water out again. But the, the important thing is, is he's prepared himself so that that bow doesn't shoot up. Uh, and reveal the boat, okay? Because you're only at periscope depth. So anyway, so that's with that's a launch with piston. That's for underwater firing, and then that that's this is what they call in German they call it Umstellhahn, which is basically a uh, like a, a selector switch, basically to say I want the air to go behind the piston or I want the air to go in front of the piston, right? High pressure air. 
Okay, so then you've got um, you've got that's with pit that's with piston. Without piston, it's simply just the air is being admitted in front of the piston, right about here, and it's pushing the torpedo itself out on the surface. Doesn't matter if you're making a bubble on the surface here. Your entire boat is on the surface, right, and you're shooting at night, right. And so you'd have if you were experiencing a torpedo shot on the surface at night, you'd hear a big bloop. You know, you'd hear a big bubble coming out of the torpedo tube when you launch it. And I think you actually hear that in Dust Bolt when they fire like their finishing shot at that um, struck stricken tanker. Um, there would be something like that. You'd have a bubble pop up. Okay. Um, so that's the torpedo. That's how torpedo launching works. There are various elements on this torpedo tube that were um, related to fire control. So you had right around in this neighborhood over here, more toward the bow, you had um, your setting for uh, torpedo speed. It was actually, it's not modeled here. It was actually a, a stem that stuck up, that stuck up like this. And it had a little knob at the top of it that you would just turn, and it would have your your speed setting. Obviously, for a G7A, which had three speed settings, that's what that's what that was for, right? But basically, what why it was a vertical little knob like that is because it has a spindle went down into the torpedo. There was a there was a socket in the torpedo that was like a four sided. With a, the the male end of it would go into that, and that was the male end there. You'd insert that down in there, and then. You're, you'd click that knob, you know, once, twice, or three times, or whatever, and it would be turning that speed setting spindle in in the torpedo, and then you'd disengage it, right? Same thing over right around here in the neighborhood of here. You'd have your depth setting again. It was also a spindle. It was a like a little hand crank, and you would actually the operator would have to um, that the torpedo mechanic would have to count the number of clicks he went, and that was your depth setting, right? Your depth setting. I can't remember what the default setting was, but at any rate, he would turn a little crank on here vertical, and that would that would tell or that would indicate how many how deep he's setting the, the torpedo. Okay, so that was done here. That was, and then of course on the TDC in the tower, because torpedo speed has direct relevance and a direct impact on um, your lead angle. The computer needed to know that in order to transmit the correct gyro angle to the back to the bow room, and so um, the TDC operator would also set in torpedo speed in the computer um, so that the math could be correct for that, okay? Um, so we've got, we've, got the we've got piston, firing piston without piston, um, depth and speed setting mechanisms, the flooding and draining, we, we, talked about, we talked about the flooding aspect, so once you fired the torpedo, you, now you've got a tube full of water again. Torpedo is gone. You got now. You got a tube full of water. Well, you took the water out of the compensating tank to flood it, and you need to keep the weight of the torpedo, the water weight that's the equivalent of the weight of the torpedo. You have to keep that on board for for your for your trim. And so, what do you do? You 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 go back to your little settings here. Let's say for this tube here is the one we shot. You go back to your settings. You that one lever that you said I wanted. To, I want to direct the low pressure air to the compensating tank. Well, now I want to flip it, and I want to say I want to I want to direct the low pressure service air to the torpedo tube and push the water out of the tube back into the torpedo compensating tank. Okay, so then you would do that. You would you would turn that back to the other setting, and then you would admit. I can't remember where the where the valve is to admit the low pressure air, but at any rate, it's in the neighborhood here, and you would then turn that, and then you would be draining your torpedo tube would be put the low pressure air would be pushing water out of the tube and then into the compensating tank all is right with the world we haven't lost anything we haven't gained anything in terms of weight we're about the same okay so that's how that's the draining of the torpedo tube that's how that works um, the firing itself there is a firing rod that's here i don't i don't so this here might approximate the fire that manual firing lever it does not look like this uh, this looks more just like a kind of a generic handle that, that they've used, which is fine. But they've got this is the firing rod here. Uh, the way this worked is there was a, a spring that you essentially cocked, and once that was cocked, you had a, uh, you had high pressure air being admitted to this to put pressure on a spring. And once you triggered the firing lever here, now there were two ways to do it. You could either do the hand lever here, which is which is manual firing, manual release, or 
what was more common was there was a there was an electric um, firing lever on you can actually see it on the bridge in Wolfpack on the UZO column if you look down on the right side is a lever that's that's the bridge that's the firing lever for the bridge the electric firing lever for the bridge okay that would trigger the there was an electric trigger mechanism here magnetic uh, coupling like release mechanism on the tube but then also um, the manual lever here. So there was one on the bridge, and then there's also one, an electric one, in the tower next to the TDC, which was for, for submerged shooting through when you're using the attack periscope. Okay? That was most common. Now, when that, let's say you're firing electrically, right, which is standard, you'd have your, your, your Lampentafel, which is your lamp board here. Which this should be angled more. It should, wasn't pointing like this. It should be angled more toward where I'm standing right now. Each light glowed, and when the electric firing lever was was pulled, either on the bridge or on, on in the tower, that particular tube, whatever was selected in the control room, uh, that particular tube got, the lamp got brighter. At that moment, the mechanic, the torpedo mechanic who was manning these tubes, would actually press the manual lever in tandem with the electric lever being pulled in case there was a failure. Every second counts. If you've got a fast target and you know and you like think about Silent Hunter. If you if you forget to open your bow caps, it only takes a few seconds, but you could possibly miss the target. Same thing here. Like if you say, Oh crap, my you know the electric uh, transmission uh, failed from the bridge or the tower for firing you don't have two seconds like you need to have that torpedo out the door like at that moment right and so as a safety precaution they would actually push you'd have you could sometimes you'd see pictures of you know these guys standing at uh, these tubes one of them's got their foot on one down here the other one's got their hand on the one up here etc cetera, etc cetera, because and they're watching this this board like a hawk and as soon as they see that that light light up on that tube, they they push it anyway, even though it's being electrically transmitted. Okay, it's just it's just to be safe. You don't you don't every second counts, right? So that's your firing, right? But the way that's basically happening is you've got you know again you've got these these um, pressurized air flasks here, right? That are pressurized to thirty atmospheres, and as soon as you release this lever, it actually releases a valve, it vents a valve that drops the pressure in, a, in, a, in, a, in such a way that it releases a spring. And it's that spring releasing that admits the air into the torpedo tube, directed, of course, and I'll use this over here as an example, directed behind the piston or in front of the piston, depending on how you, whether you're shooting surface or submerged, right? But that's how that firing mechanism works. Is you basically, it's just a, it's like a spring that's cocked, and it's in the safe position essentially, right? And and it only will be released when you when you trigger this 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 um, uh, like a pilot valve that releases the air, drops the pressure, the pre the drop in pressure um, slackens the pressure on the spring, which then moves a little, uh, essentially like a little plug that it, that that like retracts it and then re and then allows the air to come in into the torpedo in the torpedo tube and launch it. That's how that works. Okay, uh, and so uh, so you've got basically um, your firing mechanism uh, is you know obviously one of the most important things. And again, that you know this is something that could be possibly implemented in the game. I mean, you, you could you could be able to push those levers, watch that lamp board here, and you know have that functionality in here. Same thing with opening the muzzle doors. That's here. We talked about that already. Um, you put put your handle on there and open those up. Uh, the other thing that that was, and I believe they were on the bulkhead here. Are they're not actually visible? I'm not sure they're even visible in nine. They're probably not there anymore in nine and five. A lot of stuff in nine and five has been five finger discount, unfortunately, because they just don't have a lot of security precautions over there. Unfortunately, it's a, you know, but it's stuff like that's expensive and museums struggle as it is so uh, but at any rate you've got a device you've got a number of devices around the bulkheads over here uh, one of them is so you've got your G7E torpedoes which are your electric torpedoes which were more common torpedo and cheaper to produce G7A was your steam torpedo more of an old-fashioned type produced a bubble trail your G7E again electrically driven no bubble wake very advantageous but you've got 
you know, you got batteries in there, right? And you've got, uh, you've got, you you have two things to do with the battery. A, you have to charge it, and B, you have to actually heat the battery as well, because uh, an unheated uh, battery is is going to you know lower the range of your torpedo, and it's also going to lower the speed by maybe a knot and a half or so. And so it's it's very it behooves a boat uh, and it behooves a torpedo mechanic to make sure the torpedoes are constantly heated and constantly charged. Now the heating is no problem because the heating mechanism is automatic. It can be done in the tubes. The heaters are uh, the heating control unit is up on the bulkhead. The heaters are on the tubes themselves. Can't remember where they were, but at any rate, what would happen is you basically um, you've got heating going on in the tubes, and there is a uh, once there is a, a sensor in there that would basically turn the heater off, the heating device off, once um, 30 degrees centigrade was reached, and and it would maintain the tor- the, the the heat, the torpedo's heat, the battery's heat at that temperature indefinitely. Um, which is nice. There's no pulling the torpedo out, having to worry about heating, and there were also cables that were that would branch off and were able to be connected to the reserve torpedoes that were in here, and in order to heat those as well. But those would basically be you'd, you'd plug the heating unit into a socket up on top of the torpedo tube at some point in time, and that's how you could you could heat those. Okay, uh, the heating. That's how the heating. That's how the the the, the G70 heating actually worked in there. Um, so other other pieces up here that you can't really see. There are actually three oxygen flasks that are, flasks that are up in here. The boat carried oxygen um, to supplement the air. Once the air got foul, they could introduce oxygen oxygen into the boat. You've got um, your capstan, which is your essentially like your um, the device that winds your anchor up on up on the top deck. You can see it in Wolfpack if you're looking down from the bridge uh, at the fore deck. You see a little thing popping up there, like a little little knob essentially, or a little nub popping up there. That's the capstan. Shouldn't be up in Wolfpack because it was part of making the boat clear for diving once they left port. Was retra- retracting that thing down, so so the upper deck was flush. So you wouldn't see that, uh, but but it, you can see it in Wolfpack. Now that that capstan has an, a motor right and and you can wind the anchor uh, chain around that that capstan up there and the motor for that on a typical 7c was actually down beneath the torpedo tubes down here um, you've got a little modification and you'd actually see the the shaft for it coming up like this in between the tubes and so the poor guy if, if a guy ever had to go up here and and change the um, the depth setting or the uh, speed setting of a torpedo. You had to walk around this big shaft that was in the middle here, and they had control. The shaft had controls on it for the motor, if I'm remembering correctly. Now, with the advent of of loot and the installation of the loot computer up here, the loot device, that motor was moved, and and I believe this is it here actually. In 995, you can see there's a wheel. Let me go on the other side here. How you know you're looking at a motor, a control motor, in, in these boats is you see a, a box with a wheel on the side or a, or a knob on the side, and we'll see this when we go to the control room more and when we do that episode. But this is a motor. That wheel is the is the speed setting for the motor. You just one click is low speed, two clicks is a medium speed, three clicks is a higher speed, up to like five is what you typically see, right? But I believe this is actually the... Um, and if, if, if they modeled the wiring correctly, that would make sense because you can see the wiring going down beneath into the bilge, which is where the where the where the winch motor is for the anchor. And uh, the anchor would actually spool up inside of of main ballast tank five, which is main ballast tank five is up in front of this. You can see like in front of that bulkhead up there is the, is main ballast tank five, one of the um, one of the well, really, five main ballast tanks. Not all, not all of what were called main ballast tanks were really used as water ballast tanks. We'll cover that more when we get to the control room. But, um, but main ballast tank five, which is the forward ballast tank, is up in front of this bulkhead here, and sort of, and that's where the where the the anchor is off to the side of the bow, and that's actually where the where the where the would spool up. Uh, but your your uh, motor for the for the capstan itself is down below here. Um, 
and again they moved the well excuse me it would have been down below here but they, they since they moved since they did some rearranging uh with the installing loot they i believe that's what this is here they moved, they moved it up here to the upper pressure hall in order to make it more accessible um so that's that the other thing the other motor that's down here is the is the motor for the bow for the bow hydroplanes now a fun fact about the hydroplane motor you could switch to manual um you could switch the electric transmission of the of your you know your push buttons we'll get to that when we get to the control room but you know the the hydroplanes were controlled by two planesmen that were sitting at small control boxes with push buttons on them, just like in Wolfpack. And <clears throat> that's the ele that's controlled electrically, right? As you're pushing those buttons, that's sending electric signals to the motor to change the the pitch of those of the, your hydroplanes. Well, there was an option in there to switch to pull a switch, like pull a lever behind the the control box, and that would decouple the um, the electric transmission and actually allow you to turn the big wheels that were around the control box to actually manually change the angle of the hydroplanes. To get them back into electric mode, what did you have to do? You actually had to come up here or go aft, depending on what set of hydro, hydroplanes you switch to manual. You actually had to go down and lift the deck plates up, crawl down there, and flip a switch on the motor itself in order to say, hey, I want to go back on electric mode again. There was no way to do it from the control room. So that's actually a little fun, little known fact is a bit of a pain. But again, you're not switching to manual very often. Um, that the, the electric motor for the for the, um, the electric controls for the hydroplanes are actually pretty quiet, pretty quiet. So, so that's that. You've got the um, up here you would see, I'm going to go around to the other side again here. You won't see this on 995s. You won't see it in the Wolfpack boat. But up here, uh, right in this vicinity, right here, where the speaker is, would have been the would have been the vent wheel for the bow buoyancy tank. Bow buoyancy tank. What is a bow buoyancy tank? It has nothing to do with the ballast tanks. It's not a ballast tank at all. What it is is it's basically a tank that's way up, if, right behind the tip, the very tip of the of the U-boat's bow, and and at the very tip of the U-boat's stern are are the bow and stern buoyancy tanks. And what those are for is uh, is for preventing the bow from undercutting in heavy seas. If, you know, that if the bow is stamping up and down and all of a sudden the bow cuts under and you've got some speed on, that could effectively turn the, you know, the top deck almost like into a hydroplane and you could undercut and almost go into an unintended dive momentarily. So to prevent that in rough seas, they had a bow buoyancy tank. American submarines had the very same same thing okay now the bow buoyancy tank it you had a way to actually fill it with with air but that wasn't needed because when you surface a u-boat you surface it at a higher at a relatively high angle bow up and so that allowed the there's no there's a there's a vent valve at the top of the bow buoyancy tank but there's no there's an open space at the bottom and so what you would do when you do, when you dove is you would open that a man up here who was one of the um uh, one of the torpedo mechanics at the dive order would crank that open, and what he's doing there is he's allowing that to flood, right? Because it's you know it's like your, um, it's just like anything. Like if you chest it with a bottle, right? You've you've got an open, you know, you've got a an open slot at the bottom, uh, you know, that's you've got a bottle full of air, right? And you've got a cap on it, and you poke a hole in the bottom, and you put it in water. It's not going to fill up with with water. But in, when you open the cap, then all of a sudden the water is going to come into the bottle. It's the same thing here. You'd have you had to open that up to allow the air to escape and allow the water to come in. It's the same way the, the same way the ballast tanks work. We'll cover that when we get to the control room. But so the guy's got to open that um, and allow the water to come in. Once the bow cuts down, it's going to fill up with water again. So it's to prevent an air pocket in there that would delay the dive. Okay. Now when you uh, when you surface. When you surface, you still got that open, right? And so you would come up, your bow would come up, and you've got now it's now it's like your if you ever use laundry detergent that has like a has a vent valve on the back of it, you open it up and you open that up so that when you push the the button to let the soap out, that it comes out easier, right? It vents, it can the air can vent through there and make it easy and make the you know, the air that's inside the bottle essentially escape and make it easier for the liquid to pour out. It's the same thing. As soon as the bow comes up, 
as long as you've got that vent open, it allows the water that was in that to now drain. And then you would, once the boat was on the surface, that tank, that bow buoyancy tank is above the water line, you'd close this again, and then you wouldn't have to worry about it filling up with water again, even though the bottom is open. Okay? So that's the bow buoyancy. Now, where is it on 995? Well, that's a good question. If you look in the, in the control room at the forward hatch, and the same thing in Wolfpack, there are two wheels above that forward hatch. Every single iteration of a Type 7 ever since since forever, since games were being made, even Aces of the Deep has two wheels up there. It's because that's how 995 has it. However, for most of the war and most boats, it actually there was actually only one wheel up there, and that was the vent wheel for, for main ballast tank 5 up here, the forward one. That wheel that was here was moved into the control room in well, maybe around 1943 or something like that to facilitate ease of use. So because that because the bow buoyancy tank then had to be open anyway on a dive, it's much easier to have that centralized in the control that functionality centralized in the control room versus making sure uh, thinking, God, I hope one of the torpedo mechanics remember to open it way up there in the bow room. Okay? So um, so that is that's the bow buoyancy tank vent wheel. You see very rare do you actually see rarely do you actually see pictures of it. I, I do have a couple pictures of the thing being operated. Um, but you you know again because 995 is all we have, and thankfully it's all it's what we have. Um, it's you know it's a godsend that we have a Type 7. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here doing this right now. Um, that you see it up there. It's because they moved it. Most boats didn't have that. Most Type 7s didn't have that. Those two wheels up there. The, the one on the right is the one for the bow buoyancy tank. The one on the left is is and always was for main ballast tank five. Okay, so. Uh, so that's your that's your bow buoyancy tank, kind of what it is, and that's the vent there. We talked about main ballast tank five again. That's the control for that is up in the up in the is back in the control room. We'll talk about that. Um, now, if you look down here, they've modeled two of these. There were not two of these. There were only one, there was only one of these here. This is a scrubber unit, an air scrubber unit, it's part of the ventilation system. It's part of the the air renewal system, if you want to call it that way, an air renewal unit. You've got this one here is the one that actually exists. This here, there's a door here in 995. Okay, so they I think assumed that there was one on this side. There was not one on this side. There was only one unit in in the bow room, and that was on the port side. Um, and so what that does, you can see it has four canisters installed. <clears throat> there were about I don't know, maybe 150 of these can canisters stored throughout the boat. What the what the, what is in those canisters is soda lime, and what this unit is doing is, is essentially um, cleaning the air of CO2. So as you're submerged for a particular point, a period of time, normally after an hour, two hours, three hours, you would admit some of this, the contents of these bottles. There's a valve on this that is not, doesn't look like it's modeled. Well, maybe this is it here, but... Um, no, I don't think that's it. I'm not sure. There was there was a valve on uh, like a, a handle on this, and you would admit a certain amount after every hour, uh, up to a certain number of hours of submergence, and then after and after four hours, you you actually had to measure the CO2 content of the air, and then after enough time had passed, you would introduce oxygen from the oxygen flasks that are throughout the boat into into the air to replenish the air. So you're so this is for air cleaning. We'll call it air like a scrubber, scrubber unit. Now that the granules in there binds the CO2 and and dissipates it, right? And so you've got um you've got a way to to clean the air of CO, of CO2 of that people are that you know 43 guys are exhale, exhaling in the boat. So this is air cleaning, and then you've got air replenishment in the form of oxygen flasks that are throughout the boat. Okay, But again, there's only one of these units. It's the one on the port side. There's one here, there's one in the control room, and then there's one in the aft torpedo room. So we'll see those as we future videos. Okay, Okay. so so that that's that. Uh, this bad boy appears, the forward gyro angle receiver. It features very prominently in models of the bow torpedo room because it was a very prominent unit it was also a very important unit uh, it had a switch on the side here to turn the, mo the synchro motor on inside of it it had this isn't modeled too super accurately but that's fine it doesn't have any functionality and hopefully maybe at some point it will 
but basically what this what this is doing is this box is it allows the um, the personnel up here to ensure that the torpedo that the gyro angles are set appropriately in the torpedo tube what it basically does is it does two things it receives the gyro angle per the name it from electrically by way of a synchro motor in here from the TDC in the tower the TDC in the tower computes the gyro angle it sends it sends uh, it electrically to this device here there is a comparator in here that actually so these two dials here this dial this this dial and this dial are the gyro angle dials this dial here is actually the spread angle dial so you've got <clears throat> you've got a comparator motor in here that's comparing what's being received from the TDC and comparing what's currently set in the system in this device here and it's using the motor the switch of which is actually right here it's using the synchro motor to align those pointers okay to align those pointers is okay we are synchronizing with I'm we are synchronizing this unit with what's being sent from the TDC and it's doing that automatically and while it's doing that it's actually turning this here is a gyro sp angle, spindle you see these things here these are gyro spindles these are turning and setting well this is connected to the loot computer which I don't know maybe this is Maybe this was different on 995, but at any rate, you would see uh, this would go down into a gyro, and, and what was in German was called a Geastelzeug. Geastelzeug. Okay, that's the gyro angle. GA doesn't mean gyro angle; it means gerade Laufapparat, which is which is effectively another name for gyro gyro angle, gyro um, steering device. Uh, and that would actually set the gyro angle into the torpedo again via a spindle that would go down into the torpedo itself. And so this is so as this is synchronizing as these are turning, uh, these spindles are turning and setting the gyro angle into in the correct gyro angle into the gyroscope in the torpedo it, while it's in the tube. Okay, and it's doing it automatically. There were a number of switches here. The only one is modeled here. Uh, but you've got you had a switch over on the left side here to select whether or not you wanted single shot or or the the number of torpedoes if you wanted a fan a fecha a spread okay you had uh, a setting here for um, and then you had a, a switch here for whether or not you wanted the the um, gyro angle to be set automatically or you could set it by hand or if you wanted the um, just the spread angle to be set by hand or if you wanted both the spread angle and the gyro angle set by hand. Now, why does that matter? Schusswinkel automatisch would be sh gyro shooting gyro the gyro angle automatically setting. The spread angle was always set by hand, and that's the big wheel here. So you would you would set it to the top setting, which would be gyro angle automatic, um, spread angle by hand. The spread angle dial also took transmission from the TDC. It had a an inner pointer would show the transmission from the TDC and then the outer pointer would be what the what the gyro angle is currently set in the torpedoes the wheel if they if you set it to set the in, to the correct setting in order to manipulate the spread angle the the operator would watch that inner dial and when he saw it moving he would turn the wheel so that the outer pointer matched the inner pointer and what that would do is it would further turn these gyro spindles the whatever ratio corresponded with the, the spread setting that he had so if he had a if he had a spread of two it would spread it by the angle on the TDC which would be the, effectively the width the length of the target that it would cover stem to stern of the target a spread of three would take would would basically take like right and left like one and a half that so what you what you basically end up with on a german spread and this is another misconception that also exists in wolfpack and it exists in every game u-boat game the german spread angle the angle that's on the tdc is not the ang is is not the angle um between the the that the target takes up it's the angle between each individual torpedo a spread of two will put a torpedo at the, at the bow and at the stern of the target okay a spread of three will be wider than the target and a spread of four will be much wider than the target the point of a spread in the Germans eyes was to ensure one hit 
you're shooting on either you're shooting on bad data or you're shooting at super long range and you it's a hail mary i just want one of these torpedoes to hit to ensure that target gets hit it's not to cover the length of the target that was the americans used it to cover the length of the target but their whole firing system was different the germans used it to to spread it so that you'd have it just one hit i just want one hit okay that's that every game doesn't get that right that every game including silent hunter as it has you spread that over the length of the target there's no point in doing that in the german system because the germans could shift fire very quickly because their of how their tdc worked and how their optics worked you would just do if you wanted all your tar your torpedoes to hit the target you would just do subsequent single shots at different parts of the target like you do in sh3 or wolfpack or whatever the 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 German fire control system allowed for that. There's no point in making a spread that just covers the length of the target. It covers wider than the target. It casts a broad net in order to hit, um, to, to hit the target. So, so a spread of four, a spread of four is effectively three target lengths. If you think about the, 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 the width between or the spacing between each of those torpedoes is the, whatever angle is showing on the TDC. Okay, so it's effectively spreading those torpedoes over the equivalent of three target lengths in order to ensure that that gets hit. Okay, anyway, enough about the about that. That's that. So that's what this is doing. So this, by turning the wheel here, you're introducing the correct ratios into the gyro spindles in order to set these up correctly, so that one goes left so and so many degrees, the other one goes straight, the other one goes right so and so many degrees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, so that's what that's doing. Uh, now, if you could also, if you switch the switch to the to the correct uh, setting, you can also set the gyro angle by hand. Say your electric transmission of the gyro angle from the TDC to this device fa um, falls out or fails, uh, you could switch the switch here and just set the and match the pointers by hand. You're matching the pointers by hand, basically, which is actually how the stern one worked anyway. Which we'll see that when we get that far. But your operator, you know, the, the your mantra here as the operator of this thing here is I'm matching the pointers. I'm making sure the pointers stay matched because then I know that my, um, that my, um, that everything is working like it's supposed to and everything is set like it's supposed to be, okay? So that's the gyro angle receiver. Um, fire control is my area of expertise. As many of you may know, I help with the development of crush depth and uh, fire control is my area throughout the whole boat. I, I know a lot about it. If anybody has any questions, TDC, how a component like this works, etc., feel free to ask me. Um, and that goes for anything on the U-boat. Gyro angle. So um, you had your um, your intercom system. There was an intercom that was up here and had a headset device on it. The the, the, the operator of this gyro angle receiver typically had a headset on. There were there were, were various people posted throughout the boat for order transmission order that in German they call it BU that's Befehlsübermittlung that is very important in a, a U-boat transmitting orders verbally but the guy the guy who stood at this device during a uh, during battle stations uh, would also have a headset on and was it would able to be would be able to hear transmission from other uh, from you know the, the conning tower or the bridge whatever the case may be okay so that's not here but that was he here in, in real life um, you've got a um, we talked about the heating units the charging units were also here uh, the charging worked uh, a little uh, differently so you've got uh, you got an issue with charging where as you're charging these batteries you've got effectively poisonous gas forming uh, in the torpedo and so in order to make that ha to make charging possible and safe you would withdraw whatever torpedo you're charging uh, from the tube in order to ventilate it uh, for when you're after you're done charging it or while you're charging it okay and so that that's the little difference there and that charging was done I've heard various things maybe every five days maybe every seven days or so as these torpedoes would have to be charged the g7e required regular maintenance and could only be stored inside couldn't be stored in the external um, uh, top deck uh, reserves uh, because of the need for constant maintenance on the g70s 
So that lack of a bubble wake did it came with a price, and also the fact that it was cheaply produced it did come with a price after all. Uh, again, those charging units were here on, I believe they were here on the bulkhead port and starboard. Uh, there would have been two, or uh, I think two charging units here in the forward torpedo room, and I think there was one in the aft torpedo room, and those, there were four heating units though, because again, you got a heating unit for each tube. So, um, so below me now, right about below me here, is the forward trim tank. So there's one of two trim tanks on the boat. Now, it's a nomenclature thing. Wolfpack calls trimming achieving no neutral buoyancy. That is not really what trimming is. Trimming is uh, is a, is the act of moving water forward and, and aft in order to provide, provide lateral stability to the boat. Uh, the act of getting it to neutral buoyancy is a completely different system. That's the regulating tank system. That's a that's a little bit of a different animal. Um, again, part of the trim dive is indeed achieving neutral buoyancy at a particular s speed level, but trimming in terms of of nomenclature is trimming forward and trimming aft. That's we'll cover that in detail when we get to the control room. What those controls actually look like. So suffice it to say, you've got a trim tank here that's below the feet. It's Maybe contains about a three and a, uh, has a capacity for maybe about three and a half or maybe three point six. I can't quite remember three point six uh, cubic meters or tons of water. Okay, um, you've got <clears throat> you've got your loading skids very prominent here. Wolfpack's done a good job of modeling these. I I don't know a ton about the functionality of these loading skids. However, based on what I've seen in uh, you know in nine nine five, these look pretty much like it and they and I think it's really cool that they've got this one already um, this torpedo already triced up and and uh, and moved over here like it's in, like you're anticipating a load loading there and so um, the way maintenance was done with these I guess I should probably cover first of all like what how what was actually stored up here right so you've got you know next to all of the food and provisions and everything else up here you've got 10 torpedoes in this compartment when you set sail you've got You've got four in the tubes. You've got four under the deck plates here, under the deck plates here, side by side. And then you've got two sitting on the on the deck. One, and you can sort of see where they have a model, kind of where they would sit. Now the floor in real life would actually slope up on the side so that the torpedoes were nestled in there. There would be a little bit of a slope, so it wouldn't be a flat floor like this. It would slope up a little bit. And then behind this, you would actually see the um, the compressed air groups. There was a group of two groups of compressed air tanks that were high pressure compressed air tanks that were up here. You can actually see those back there as well. But but the floor would slope like that, and you'd have nestled in there would be your two. Uh, the Germans called it a Zusatzlager. Zusatzlager is like your is like your additional storage space for torpedoes. There were two, and they would sit on the floor, and on top of those you'd have wood boards. Uh, so that you could cr walk, try to walk, or effectively crawl until those two torpedoes were gone. Um, you couldn't, you you couldn't walk around upright. That's why you, you hear in, when you're watching Das Boot, um, you hear uh, like in their first attack when they're when they're going into attack, you hear one of the torpedo mechanics, or I can't remember if it's a torpedo mechanic, but anyway, one of the ratings that sleeps up in the bow room. You know, he says, he says, yeah, let's get these, you know, get a couple out of here so we have some more space. What he's talking about is he's talking about these two beasts that are sitting on the floor that are taking up all the space, making them having to walk and eat, etc., and crouch on wood boards uh, until they're gone. Uh, those two torpedoes here that were stored here, they could, they had to be G7Es because the the way that they were, they would sitting the 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 uh, access door to the engine chamber was actually sitting like on the floor and it was not good for whatever reason to have that that way and so the the protocol was to actually not store g7a's on the deck plates here uh, those had to be g7e's now how so you've got so 10 torpedoes up here you've got one overhead that's ac accessible from the top deck and a tube up there it's one of your two external reserves there's one in the bow and then there's one in the stern but so you've got that up there as well, but again, <coughs> 10 in the bow room. Uh, you've got almost a daily requirement to do something with your torpedoes. Now, typically, they'd, they'd coincide torpedo maintenance with the trim dive. 
So you'd, you'd I mean, in the morning, you'd have a trim dive, you get your trim all correct, and then you'd maybe stay down for another hour or so and do torpedo maintenance and torpedo servicing. And so you'd this whole this area would turn basically into a giant workshop. They'd trice up all the bunks like this. They would um, they would basically just become transformed into a workspace. You'd have your two torpedo mechs, and and their boss was essentially the torpedo mechanic torpedo mechanics mate. Uh, working on the torpedoes, they'd pull them out, and I'm I'm still trying to track down documentation of how the, the, what the maintenance schedule actually looked like for torpedoes on U-boats. It was a little different than the rest of the Kriegsmarine unit, but at any rate, you would have you would it would look almost like this, where you'd have one high and one low. So again, you had two your two additional torpedoes stored on the floor. You would raise one up, and you have one below. So you'd raise one up if you had to get at the ones that were below that, that were below the floor plates. Uh, you'd always have one raised up in order to load the top tube, or you'd raise one up in order to lower the bottom, one of the bottom tubes. So there was always, the key takeaway is it's one high, one low was typically. Now, it was designed to have, to carry one high all the time and one low. However, in practice, both of the, both of them just sat on the floor. It's probably safer that way. Uh, and easier to get around, certainly in the bow room, without a torpedo actually hanging um, up here, like you see in 995. Okay, but it would typically be one high, one low, and you'd have uh, you, that would give them the ability to get at whatever torpedo they needed to get at by raising one up and keeping one down, or one up and the other down. Right. So that's how that's how that that's how that works. So that's how that's where torpedoes and how torpedoes were stored in the bow room. Uh, you know, you'd have in terms of overall torpedo loading, the Type 7 was designed to carry a maximum of 9 G7E and 5 G7A. The two torpedoes in the external compartments and the top deck had to be G7A because they were inaccessible for the regular maintenance that was required for electrics. Um, the two, I talked about these here, um, the two here had to be uh, G7Es, and then you had also one in the, uh, uh, oh, and then, excuse me, there were, um, there were the, the, a couple of these in the, in the, um, uh, under the floor plates were, were practically also inaccessible to regular maintenance, and so you had, so you had the one, the, the two up in the external reserve, that's two, you've got two of them that are under the floor plates, which are more or less inaccessible, the ones like the out, I believe it was, would have been the outboard ones, were inaccessible for regular maintenance. And so you had those that had to be G7As. And then you had the the one that was loaded under the floor plates in the aft torpedo room was also a G7A because the, the aft torpedo room is not conducive to, um, to the maintenance that's required for that. Although there are accounts of G7Es being loaded there. So maybe it's just a function of risk of, of being able to of weighing the risk and accepting a certain amount of risk by carrying that back there. But anyway, nine is your typical loadout for G7E and five is your typical loadout for G7A. Now, in practice, it could have been any sort of mix, right? But the max is generally nine for G7E is what you, is what you read about. Um, we talked about con torpedo compensating tanks two and three. Those are here. Those, each of those, uh, contains about 5.9 tons capacity of water, cubic meters of, of, of capacity of volume. Uh, and it, we talked about those at length. Those are basically, those are flooded already to a certain amount, to a certain degree when leaving port. Uh, the object of which is to flood the first torpedo tubes that are fired. Right. And then once those tubes fill up with water again, you're using low pressure air to push that water back out into the torpedo compensating tanks so that you, over, you so you maintain your weight that you started with to re, to replace the lost weight of the torpedoes. All right, we talked about the the high pressure air flasks already. Uh, you've got those are there are two groups: is one port and one starboard. Uh, we talked about torpedo storage capabilities. The loading hatch you can see. Uh, that's up here. So they've got that modeled in here. You'd have uh, you would have the capability of 
of um, loading torpedoes down into this even at sea because you've got your your external um, your external storage container. Uh, you had a pulley system by which you could basically relatively primitive system where you'd rig that up and then you were able to sort of balance that torpedo down through this loading hatch and get that torpedo inside the boat even at sea. So that's the torpedo loading hatch. Uh, this here, back here, I figured I'd, I would just add it. This is actually a locker for rain gear. Um, that's actually rain gear. Now rain gear, your your oil skins essentially, right? They they were, the aft torpedo room was because of the, of the uh, heat in there. The aft torpedo room was actually a good place for drying. And so they would typically have uh, lines strung up in the, in the aft torpedo room in order to dry the wet rain gear. But this is actually the, the, the designated area, storage area for rain gear was, was actually here. And why would that be the case? Well, it's because of who slept here. So you've got, you can see here, um, you've got uh, t what amount to basically 12 bunks. You've got six bunks in there. You can see they're triced up right now, but you've got six bunks on a side. Three up, three down, three up, three down. You got a number of lockers here. They're actually in total. There's about 36 lockers here. They've got some of these doubled up, but they're in reality they weren't, they weren't really that big. They were smaller, and there's about 36 of them. There are not 36 guys that sleep in here, but there were 36 lockers. Um, you've got so you've got so you've got uh, 12 bunks in in total here. It means 12 guys slept here. It does not mean that 12 guys slept here. It actually means that about 24 guys, or 20, excuse me, 25 guys slept up here. Uh, you've got, you've got, um, you've got space for guys sleeping in bunks, and then you also have a number of hammocks that would be. I want to say maybe four hammocks that would be that would be dangling from the overhead here, uh, in the middle. So you've got two torpedoes on the deck covered with wooden boards with provisions everywhere, provisions stacked between the torpedo tubes, in front of the torpedo tubes, behind, all up in here, behind here by the oxygen flask, you've got food everywhere, cans everywhere, buckets, etc. And then you've got your bunks here, and then you've got hammocks hanging down in the middle. So there's like practically no room in here to do anything else, at least early on in the voyage, right? So who would have slept here? This would have been your ratings. These would have been your, um, you, these would have been your nine, uh, your, the, the seamen that stood uh, bridge watch. So there were six seamen that stood bridge watch. There were three helmsmen would be up here. So that's nine, uh, your seagoing personnel, your basic non-rated, essentially non-rated uh, basic seamen of, of, the, of the seamen's division. U-boats were divided up into divisions, right? You got your seamen's division, your technical division, depending on what your job is. So your seamen's division, you got your nine guys that were part of your sea watches, that would be your bridge watch, and your uh, and your your helmsman. And of the seamen, you'd have of those guys, uh, three guys would share two bunks, and so you've got what it, what it, what amounts to six bunks being occupied by the seamen. Okay, and then you've got uh, you've got your, there were four, uh, diesel mechanics that would sleep up here that were basic, you know, basically rated seamen or technical personnel or whatever that were, uh, your diesel mechanics, four of those and those, the, all the technical personnel would share, it would be two men to a bunk. So they do their hot bunking just based on two men to a bunk. So you got four of those diesel mechanics sleeping up here. So that's two more bunks. You've got four, um, the, uh, electrical techs that are basic, basically rated, uh, non, you know, like enlisted non NCO, uh, uh, essentially electricians that sleep up here. And again, those four of those, so they'll share, you know, two men, two bunks. That's another two bunks. Uh, then you've got your, um, you've got your radio men who are also, uh, there's two of those that are non NCOs. They're, they each, each of them works under a mate, a radio mate, but you've got two of them that sleep in here. And then you've got your cook. Your cook on a U-boat is a basic uh, seaman. He's not He's not an, an officer. He's not even an NCO. He's a basic rate, non-raid, essentially. Uh, he sleeps up here, and he sleeps in his own hammock. You're, uh, and then you've got your torpedo men who sleep up here as well. Uh, there are three of those. You've got two torpedo mechanics who, are, who assist the torpedo mechanic's mate. 
So there are in total three torpedo men aboard. Uh, those tor the torpedo mechanics made is the only NCO to sleep up in the bow room. He sleeps at the place of his work and he sleeps in the bow room and he gets his own bunk and he doesn't share it with anybody because he rates that because he's a he's a mate, right? He's an he's an NCO. So he's got uh, he's got his own bunk. The torpedo mechanics mates they've got hammocks. The cook has a hammock as well. Uh, and then they've got, and then you've got your radio men who also have hammocks. Then maybe there's five hammocks then in this compartment. Radio men have hammocks. The two guys I missed were the um, are the control room attendants. So you got your control room mate working under your control room mate is one other guy who the control room mate basically keeps his eye on and lights into when something is not right in the control room. That's your I call him a control. In German, it's zentrale Gast. The, the phrase Gast is not a well-translated word. It doesn't mean guest. It's a different word altogether. It's like a your your person who works at something like a, like a Funkgast is a is a uh, like a radio attendant. It's like your basic radio sailor, and your basic control room sailor is your zentrale Gast. So the two zentrale Gasten, not Gäste, the two zentrale Gasten slept up in the up here, and they shared a bunk. So all told, you've got 25 guys that sleep up here in the bow room at various times during the day. A very, 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 very busy place. And they ate up here as well. And to facil facilitate the eating, there were three tables that could be in installed here. And they're kind of off to one side. They were, I believe they're off to the starboard side. But you'd see three tables here, and they were obviously collapsible, removable, so that the work up here could be done. That is out of the question, of course, when you've got your reserve torpedoes sitting, or your additional torpedoes sitting on the floor here. But once those were gone, then you could bust the tables out and actually have some sort of, you know, something that resembled, you know, a, a meal at a table up here in the bow room. So that covers the sleeping arrangements up here. So who actually stood watch up here? The torpedo men themselves did not stand a regular watch. They, uh... They, they were responsible for the maintenance of the torpedoes and the operation of the tubes, etc., and all the, the mechanisms around the torpedo firing and the um, operating of, of the tubes and servicing the torpedoes, and that's it. The two, two torpedo mechanics that assisted the mechanics made, they could get pulled for mess duty. Uh, that was a, a duty that was typically done by the seagoing personnel, of which the torpedo men were a part of. Um, they could get pulled for what was called bakshafta. They could be bakshafta, or bakshafta were basically uh, your mess, your stewards. They were the stewards that would attend to, uh, they would serve meals to the various compartments. There were usually two of those at every meal times. So they'd get pulled from the different different people, at different or different guys throughout the patrol, uh, maybe on a rotation. But uh, the torpedo mechs could be pulled for that duty. Of course, they were also um, taking part in the daily what was called Rheinschiff, which is the German naval tradition of cleaning the boat, cleaning the ship. Uh, that happened about usually about 7 a.m. every day, um, may, sometimes coinciding with the trim dive to make the, just cleaning easier. Uh, but basically cleaning up, as you'd see typically in every uh, you know subset of the military everywhere, is keeping stuff clean. Cleanliness is a high priority. The grimy boat that you see in dust boat. You know, it's not so much to that extent. They 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 generally, I guess it depends on the commander, but generally the boats were kept in pretty orderly shape and relatively clean. Uh, couldn't do anything about the food spoiling, but in terms of just living in filth, no, not not happening. So, uh, so that's so that's the, the you got your torpedo mechanics and their and their mechanics made up here. Uh, nobody is standing watch up here. The men who are working up here are either servicing torpedoes or at battle stations. Now, at, at, at sur tor torpedo servicing, you know, you've got your three guys. You've got your torpedo mechanics mate and his two torpedo mechanics working on the torpedoes. Maybe some guys are there to help take the torpedoes out and manhandle the, the torpedoes. But generally, that's it. Battle stations is a different story. You've got two technicians up here that were designated to stand up here as what the Germans called Leckwehrgruppen, which are which is essentially leak, like a like a um, like groups to combat leaks, the like groups to, uh, to 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 like designated groups that are posted throughout the boat in order to take care of leaks as they happen. So you got two people from the technical division up here as Leckwehrgruppen, as a Leckwehrgruppe, and then you've got um, you've got one seaman posted up here at the hatch who was 
who was for order, for BU for which is order transmission. So he's here passing orders forward and, and aft. You got that. You of course you've got the the torpedo mechanics mate. He's going to be up here at the torpedoes with his hand overseeing the other uh, torpedo mechanics mate that's up here. You're going to have one torpedo mechanics mate at battle stations. He's actually going to be in the aft torpedo room. He's going to be on his own back there. That's fine. He's only got one torpedo tube to deal with. But your mechanics mate is making sure everybody's doing their job up here during battle stations, right? Your torpedo mechanic is up here, uh, you know, standing by another tube. He is not doing this. So your um, your your gyro angle receiver is actually an, a, a a basic seaman from the seaman's division uh, is actually doing this job up here. He's watching this. He's taking. He's got his headset on. He's taking orders from the tower, from the from the control or from the counting tower, from the bridge, whatever the case may be. He's watching the lamp, the the, uh, the lamp board here. Well, I guess he's not watching the lamp board. The guys that, that are at the firing triggers are watching the lamp board. But he's taking orders, and he's he's watching these dials. He's making sure that the torpedoes are set how they should be. The mechanic would be going up here and making all the adjustments to speed, to the depth that's that are ordered from... Um, from the uh, from the bridge or from the tower, okay. So that's who's up here in battle stations. What you what what basically amounts to um, six guys are up here at battle stations, okay. So that's that's that. Everybody else is sort of throughout the boat. The dust boat I think makes it seem like this is really packed up here. It really wasn't that packed. You just got the essential personnel up here in the bow room, uh, either to combat leaks or to uh, man the tubes and set the various things. So that's why I say when you got a spread of four happening, that spread will be fired electrically and it will be fired automatically. But again, because just for safety, you've got you gotta have a hand on these manual launch levers and push them at the same time that the electric trigger is pulled remotely. And that's why you say, why I say, you you know, you've only got the mechanics mate up here and one torpedo mechanic. One of them is going to be standing here. The other one's going to be standing in front of the other bank of tubes over there. And they got one hand up here, and they've got one foot down here at, at the at the manual levers there, and they're watching that board. And as soon as they see those lamps light up, get brighter, they're pushing those to make sure that those torpedoes are actually leaving the tubes in case of an electrical failure. All right, so that is that. That's it. That's about as much as I can cover in the bow room. Uh, if there's anything I missed in here, this is actually a, a, a heating unit. I'm not sure if it was original to 995 or what, or what, but these are the ventilation ducts here. So the ventilation system, and these will actually run to the scrubber. To this, one of those will run to the scrubber unit over here that we talked about. But I guess as an aside, that's the. These are the ventilation ducts. You see these running up length of the boat one is one is um i can't remember which is which this might be air intake and then this is air exhaust so it's you know the air is circulating back here uh a uh well i guess this might be a little much for this video but there's a there are ventilators that are in the diesel room and they're pushing air this way and then sucking air back through here back that way right Back. So that's, but that's just in interest of full disclosure. That's what these are here. These are the ventilation ducts that are pushing air, pulling air from outside, pushing air throughout the boat, and then pushing it back outside again. Keep the air relatively fresh in the boat, at least when you're on the surface. So, so that's that. So that's the first video. I, I plan to make one video for each of these individual compartments and cover all of the things that I'm aware of, uh, and even you know things that could possibly be implemented in Wolfpack if they do decide, and all fingers and toes crossed, if they do decide to go the route of more functionality in the boat, which frankly I think would be a welcome. I mean that's that's the been the aim of Crush Depth, but I think you know Wolf, if Crush Depth can get to that point, absolutely great. If Wolfpack can maybe introduce a little bit of that additional functionality, I think people would you know based on how people are on the Discord and and just overall interest level, I, I think that there's space and room for that type of development to actually happen. You know, people are interested in the technical systems. There's plenty of us around, myself, uh, engineer guy. So Patrick, he's super knowledgeable. I owe a lot of my knowledge to him. 
a lot of my knowledge is from independent research, but again, there's a lot of us around there that know a lot about these boats and how stuff function. Reach out to us, you know, and that goes for anybody. Reach out to us, you know, how does this work? How does that work? You know, the documentation is out there and the know-how and the knowledge is out there. It's just making, putting this type of thing in, finally, into a submarine simulator, into a sub-sim. Flight sims have, you know, their full fidelity models, you know, with a little creativity and a little, um, you, you know, a little effort. It doesn't, doesn't take much to, to sort of think through how that type of full fidelity can happen uh, where you don't have to maybe touch every single thing in the boat, but you, but things are happening in front of you realistically and operating the way you would expect them to operate based on how, knowledge of how these boats actually work. So at any rate, uh, first video, one of several that I'll make, you know, let me know if this was helpful, if this was interesting and and like I said, I'll plan on making more of the rest of the boat as, as time goes by here uh, soon. So take care, everybody.